Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Karn Academy. My name is Karn, and today we're going to be talking about appendicitis. Now, appendicitis is one of those conditions which I'm sure you have a very good understanding of when it comes to general principles. And therefore, today I won't be just talking about well, very broad, basic concepts on exam questions. I think you will know that. Today, I'll focus a bit more on the clinical side of things to give you a perspective um, based on what I've seen personally in hospital. Now, appendicitis is the most common surgical cause of an acute abdomen in both children and adults with a lifetime incidence of about 8%. And this is really obviously quite high. Now, what causes appendicitis? For some reason, we have an occlusion in, near the appendix, which causes collection of fecal matter, which gets infected and inflamed. And that's why you have the itis part of appendicitis, relatively straightforward. Now, the causes depend highly on the patient's age. With children, the most common cause or the predisposing factor to appendicitis is lymphoid hyperplasia. Now, this can often be because of some other viral illness and because of things like mesenteric adenitis as well, where you just have inflammation of the lymph nodes, but if the lymph nodes are enlarged near the appendix, that can cause an occlusion. Next, with adults, we have fecalit impaction. So fecalits are kind of these stony formations, mostly made of fecal matter. And these are going to be hard and therefore can cause an impaction and subsequent obstruction. And with elderly patients, the thing we worry about the most is a colorectal carcinoma of the right side. Now, how does appendicitis present? Now, in terms of systemic symptoms, you could have nausea, vomiting, fever, and anorexia. These are all important features to ask and elicit on a history. In terms of GI symptoms, I'm sure you're very familiar with the typical appendicidal pain that is usually starting in the paraumbilical area and then migrating to the right iliac fossa. Now, why is this the case? Well, when you have inflammation of the appendix and as it's increasing, the first um, peritoneum that it would affect would be the visceral peritoneum. Now, the visceral peritoneum is not very well um, or doesn't have a very good nervous supply. Um, the reason for that is when you think of it, your skin needs a very good nervous supply. You need to know exactly where you're feeling that sensation from. When it comes to your internal organs, it's not that important because it's not really a survival mechanism, right? And therefore, your visceral peritoneum is really, really bad at telling your mind where the pain is coming from. And therefore, when you have inflammation of the visceral peritoneum near the appendix, it would often present as pain in the umbilical area. However, as the pain get, as the inflammation gets worse and worse, that inf inflammation is now not only going to affect the visceral peritoneum, but also the parietal peritoneum. And the parietal peritoneum is much, has a better neurovascular supply and is better at localizing the pain specifically. And therefore, you now have pain in the right iliac fossa. It's not a change in where the inflammation is. The inflammation is, is and has always been in the same spot. It's just how bad the inflammation is. You can also get changes to your bowel habits and diarrhea and constipation would be the two main ones. Now let's talk about some important exam findings. So with any clinical examination, you, I hope you would be having a systemic approach and taking a focused exam. But in this case, one of the first things we always need to assess is how sick is the patient, regardless of whether they have a posting, rough saying, or so a sign, we need to know how urgently do we have to tend to this patient. Are they coming in with just mild appendicitis, a bit of discomfort, or do they have a perforation and they're hemodynamically unstable? That's the first thing you need to assess, and vitals are really, really good. Many patients, so most patients you would see with mild to moderate appendicitis, which is what they would have, they might have a temp and a potentially uh, and a potential tachycardia. The BP, respirate, and oxygen saturation should normally be within the normal parameters. If you see hypotension, if you see tachypnea, if you see hypoxia, those are all signs of uh, a severe appendicitis. But we will talk about how to grade appendicitis in a few slides. The, the abdominal examination, you would obviously start off with palpation and precaution, all that. But a few specific signs that would be elicited with ac acute appendicitis are tenderness at the McBurney point, guarding and or rigidity, rebound tenderness, the Rovsing, psoas and obturator sign. So let's talk about what each one of these are. So the tenderness of, at the McBurney point is the, is the, physical, is the physical location um, which corresponds to the base of the appendix. 
Now, what is guarding and rigidity and how is it different to rebound tenderness? Now, when your peritoneum is inflamed, right, and whenever the visceral peritoneum especially is inflamed, you want to minimize the degree of movement because any movement kind of hurts, which is why a lot of patients with these acute abdomens on the right end would say the speed bumps were really, really horrible because as the internal organs move, it, it elicits quite a bit of pain. And therefore, guarding is your body's way of preventing that. So you tense up your abdomen and everything's um, rigid. Um, so rigidity and guarding are kind of a similar concept on a scale. So rigidity is a more severe form of guarding. Um, guarding is more so when you press, you may, see, may, you may feel them tense up versus rigidity where they're rigid throughout. Rebound tenderness is slightly different. Now with rebound tenderness, what you do is you first press deep or from deep palpation, and then you release your hand and ask whether there was pain as you were taking off your hand. Now this indicates that there's inflammation of the peritoneum, and that's relatively important to know. The Rolfsing sign is pain elicited in the right lower quadrant when we deep palpate the left lower quadrant. Why do you get this? Well, this has to do with the parietal peritoneum. Now the parietal peritoneum is continuous, right? It's the one single peritoneum moving from left to right. And therefore, when you push on the, or when you push deeply on the left, it tenses the entire peritoneum. Think of it like cling wrap, right? If you pull one side, the other side is gonna pull as well. And when the left pulls, or when you press on the left, the right lower quadrant or the peritoneum in the light, right lower quadrant also moves. And that is obviously gonna elicit pain. You then have the source and the obturator sign. So the source sign is when you have pain elicited on flexing the right hip um, with the stretched leg against resistance. So flex right hip and have a stretched leg. And then you have the obturator sign, which is right lower quadrant pain on passive internal rotation of the right hip. The source and obturator sign are not very commonly done, but I guess it's good to know for your examinations. Now, what investigations to consider? Bedside, I've mentioned a urinalysis, blood sugar level, urinary beta ITG test, FB, UEC, CRP, and then a few imaging tests. So let's go through each one of these because as you know, just listing these are good enough for most cases, but if you can explain either to your consultant or in an OSCE as to why you're doing certain investigations, it, it is relatively important. So with your analysis, we're worried right about a UTI. Could they, could they potentially have a UTI that's causing very similar um, lower abdominal symptoms? Now, you can also get mild hematuria with acute metastasis, and that's important to know. With their blood sugar levels, firstly, we would ask them if they're diabetic. And why is that important? Well, it's important because with diabetes, they are at a much higher rate, at a higher risk of complications. The other week, I saw a diabetic patient who had come in with an appendicitis. They were clinically very well. They were hemodynamically stable, and they didn't have too much pain. They had pain in the right, right lower quadrant, but it, was, it wasn't kind of out of bounds with their uh, symptomology. And then, well, we assumed or we believed it was appendicitis, took them in for surgery. The patient was about 50 years old. And as we go in, we noticed that the appendix is really, really inflamed. And the moment we manipulate it through a laparoscopic approach, it perforates. So this was a really, really bad appendix that's hard to handle. And this is quite commonly seen with diabetics where the symptomology is not consistent with the severity often. Um, a urinary beta HCG test, always, always important in any female presenting with, uh, any female presenting with abdominal pain with bloods and FBE to look for leukocytosis that would typically have a left shift. And what that means is you have higher levels of neutrophils. A UEC important before surgery to assess their renal function and a CRP. And a CRP can often be a very good indicator of severity when it comes to appendicitis. Um, for the patient we, I just talked about, they were clinically well, but their CRP was about 300. The normal CRP should be less than five. And therefore, it was a bit confusing because the patient seemed really well, but their CRP was very, very high. In terms of imaging, we can either do a CT abdomen or an ultrasound of the abdomen. Both are good, but the CT abdomen with contrast is the gold standard test for acute appendicitis. You could see a peritoneal fluid collection if there is a perforation. Frat, uh, fat stranding, which just indicates inflammation around the appendix. You can actually, in some cases, see the fecalith as well. But in some other cases, you can just see 
lymphadenopathy associated with that infection and inflammation. An ultrasound is not going to show you as much. It can see things like a distended appendix, and there's a thing called a target sign where you have hypoechoic um, segments near the ileocecal valve, which can indicate appendicitis, but always know that a normal ultrasound does not rule out appendicitis. So is this appendicitis is a good question to always ask yourself, right? Because a, a, an acute abdomen or abdominal pain is one of the most common presentations to the ED. So we have many scores to assess this. And the one that I think is relevant for your year level is called the Alvarado score. It has a few kind of parameters um, and the mnemonic for it is mantrals. So migration of pain, typically from the umbilical area to the right iliac fossa, anorexia or not eating food, nausea, tenderness, rebound pain, uh, a febrile episode, leukocytosis, and then shift of white blood cells to the left, meaning a neutrophilia. And we have a total score out of 10. Anything less than four indicates a low likelihood. Five to six is moderate. Anything seven or above is quite high. Now managing acute appendicitis. Firstly, you want to start with the basic stuff, right? Fluid replenishment. Any surgical case, acute abdomen, always, always, you cannot go wrong by mentioning these six things that I've talked about. So fluid replenishment, bowel rest, nail by mouth, because they're probably going to undergo surgery. IV analgesia, IV antiemetics, and antipyretics. These are six things which is a which are a very, very safe answer whenever you have a patient coming in with an acute abdomen. The gold standard treatment is going to be an appendectomy, which can either be laparoscopic or open. These days, you tend to go with a laparoscopic approach in most, most, most cases. I personally haven't seen an open appendectomy, but it does happen sometimes. And you always give empirical antibiotics. And the one that I've always seen given is tefazolin and metronidazole. And that's two and two grams IV and then 500 milligrams IV. The duration of treatment often depends on the severity. What I've heard is if you have a perforation or an abscess or some collection, you often try for a five-day course. Otherwise, it's usually three days. Otherwise, you take them off once they're clinically well. But I don't think you need to know that much. I think just knowing cafezolin and metronidazole are common um, empirical antibiotics for acute appendicitis would be enough. When I say empirical, I still mean you would be proceeding with an appendectomy, but this is something that you just do on the side. Now, this is not really important, but I think it's interesting. Um, here you have what now I realize is a very, very poor resolution diagram of the appendix. So this is the appendix. Um, you have the formiform process and the appendicular artery. And this is what it looks like here. I want to talk about very briefly what a laparoscopic appendectomy looks like. We usually go with a two-port approach, one at the umbilicus and one either midline or uh, slightly to the left. You insert two probes, um, and these allow you to insert, obviously, many instruments. Commonly, one is obviously, one of them is going to be the camera. And then with the other, you can either um, use one single port or you can use two ports. So the most common approaches you're going to see is a three-port laparoscopic appendectomy. What you do is first you localize the appendix and you assess it for kind of perforations. And obviously, you can see there's hyperemia of the blood vessels. It seems inflamed. So you probably made the right diagnosis. The next thing you want to do is you want to dissect across this part. So this, this is going to be covered with a lot of fat in this space. You kind of dissect along that. You then localize the appendicular artery and you ligate or you clamp it because you don't want it to bleed. Once you do that, you then tie two bands um, or these nylon based ties around the appendix. So let's say one here and then one at the base. And then you cut the appendix, put it in a bag and then take out the bag. So here we have a very short case to again, go through what that might look like in hospital. So Mr. Beck is a 28 year old builder who presents at the ED on Sunday with a three year history of right iliac fossa pain. He is nauseated and is vomited. So I know the answer is gonna be appendicitis, <laughs> but for, the case, for, the, for this case, let's just say it, it, it's something else. He just has an acute abdomen and we want to come up with a list of differentials. So we will prioritize our conditions into well, most likely, or what's most common, what we must exclude, the remainder of that, and then what will kill this man if we miss out. 
So here's a list of things I have. So appendicitis is a good first bet. It's also a red flag condition. Gastroenteritis, you see. Again, common, but won't really kill him. Acute pancreatitis, very important to exclude. Testicular torsion, another big one that can present with right iliac fossa pain. You can have Meckel's diverticulitis and an SBO, although these are less likely to be the case. And SBO, because of his age, we don't really have any other information about past abdominal surgery. Meckel's unlikely to present solely with right iliac fossa pain. It usually has a few other symptoms as well. If this patient was a female, you should always, other con always consider some other gynecological pathologies. So these include ectopic pregnancies, PID, salpingitis, and, and then ovarian pathology like torsions, hemorrhage, or cysts um, that may have ruptured or ble bled. In any patient, in any female of reproductive age, always, always perform a pregnancy test. We do this not just to exclude an ectopic, but also if they were pregnant and didn't know, we would we wouldn't want to expose the fetus to high levels of radiation through things like CTs that are obviously going to harm the fetus, if, if, especially if it's in early development. <clears throat> so let's say we take a further history and we establish that Mr. Beck has had a milder, poorly localized central abdominal pain for about 12 hours prior to the onset of the right iliac fossa pain. Well, this, this does sound like appendicitis, doesn't it? Ugh. Yeah, the pain worsened about three hours ago, and he's now felt it shift to the right. The pain is constant ever since. It doesn't go anywhere, and he struggles to give much of a description apart from the, just what we've already got, and just says pain is pain. This is something that you very commonly encounter. I know in second year, we go through our WWQQA BICE acronym, and we ask questions. Does anything make it better? Does anything make it worse? Can you rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? Often you just see patients saying, look, I don't know. It just, just hurts. Does anything make it better? No, not really. Does anything make it worse? No. Moving, moving makes it worse. Not moving makes it better. That's a very typical answer you'd get. Um, so that's not often very reliable. He hasn't taken anything for the pain. And it's always a good question to ask. Have you taken anything? And is it responding? He rates it as an 8 out of 10. He's not aware of anything that makes the pain worse, but is reluctant to lie flat on the bed. And you notice that he keeps his right hip flexed. He had his customary Saturday night curry yesterday. Um, sounds like something I would do, but haven't got appendicitis yet, so that's good. Um, the reason he keeps his, his right hip flexed, again, going back to our signs, the peritoneum is relaxed in this position. If you deflex your hip, you would stretch on the peritoneum, and any stretch of the peritoneum is going to cause pain. Mr. Beck is quite the spice enthusiast, so he orders the hottest dish on the menu, and he's always had this, but never suffered any ill effects. None of his other friends have similar symptoms. He has lost his appetite, has not opened his bowels. He's felt otherwise well, and on clinical examination, Mr. Beck's face appears flush, and he's reluctant to lie flat. Mr. Beck is febrile. He's tachycardic and normotensive with a rest rate of 20. He's asked to cough and finds this incredibly painful, clutching his hand over his right side. So again, he's febrile, well, expected. He has a slight tacky. He's normal tensive and a respirator of 20. So this, again, fits in with our picture of appendicitis, but I'm not particularly concerned about this man just yet. He's normal tensive, his respirator is normal. He's in pain, and that's a given, but it's not um, something that would make me worry at this stage. He's asked to cough and finds this painful. Well, why is coughing painful? Well, with coughing, you increase your intra-abdominal pressure, which again is going to cause compression of the appendix against the visceral and the parietal peritoneum, which is painful. There is guarding in the right iliac fossa, and palpation in the left generates pain on the right. And this is a positive Rofsing. There's no palpable cervical lymph nodes, no abdominal masses. It is difficult to palpate the liver, spleen, and kidneys. Nevertheless, there's no organomeg organomegaly detected. Abdominal node has pulse style, but not expansile. Precaution tenderness is maximal over a point approximately two-thirds of the distance from the umbilical, umbilicus laterally towards the anterior superior iliac spine, and that's the McBurney's point. When I say precaution tenderness is maximal, this obviously indicates that there is some inflammation going on at that point, and the McBurney point is specific for the base of the pancreas. Bowel sounds are normal, and that's good. 
He doesn't have an obstruction based on the bowel sounds. Examination of the external genitalia and hernial orifices is unremarkable. Always check for hernias, always check for testicular pathology. Once it's explained why a digital rectal exam would aid diagnosis, Mr. Beck cons <laughs> consents to the procedure. The rectum is empty, there's no blood and there's no focal tenderness. So investigations that we've already done. So a BSL, PR exam, ultrasound, FB, UEC, LFT, sim lipase for pancreatitis and the rest. So what did we get back? So we do a few blood tests. The white cell count is 13.2. This should be in 10 to the power 9. The normal, um, and the neutrophils are 10.5. And this is obviously greater than 75%, which indicates a left shift. He has a CRP of 32, which is high, but not super, super high. It's amylase is 200, so it's not three times the limit. All other blood tests are unremarkable. Urine dipstick is negative for protein. Nothing else is going on there. A plain abdominal radiography. You see a single dilated loop of bowel in the right left fossa, but nothing else, which is normal. There's no signs of a pneumoperitoneum, so we're not worried about a perforation. This is a classical picture of acute appendicitis, where you have low-grade central abdominal pain, which then goes to the right left fossa. Anorexia is a very reliable feature, surprisingly. And he, the patient is obviously in pain and distress and is lying still to minimize movement. And that is going to be consistent with the picture of appendicitis. You can go back to, Al to our Alvarado score and check. I would highly recommend you go back, rewind the video and go back and check how many features this person meets. And you would find that he is likely and highly likely to have appendicitis. This man would have then undergone a laparoscopic appendectomy and given IV antibiotics, empiricals, so kefazolin and metronidazole, for about three days, unless there's a perforation, in which case we extend that to five days and then send this man home. And with any, lapar any, any operation, you advise them um, to check in with their GP for management of their wound and just checking the dressings the same, uh, the same week or after a week. And then no heavy lifting, nothing more than five kgs for about four to six weeks, right? And that's all I had for acute appendicitis. Thank you all for coming. As always, any questions, feel free to chuck me a message or an email. And as always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.